I said it's live on top of my uh, my screen right there. We're live. Oh, yeah, we are. Okay, live. we're going. We're live. Hey, Andy, take it away, Andy. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. Prime time. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. Prime time. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guitar nerds of all ages, it's prime time. That's it. It's live time. It's San Diego. Featuring live on top of my uh, my screen right there. Bruce Sharp. You can call him Sharpie. Nice. Special guest tonight, a man who's wishing he was fishing, and that would be Taylor Guitars Service Network Manager, Mr. Rob McGargle. Hey, Rob. Stop. Your dedicated, humble host, dreaming about the baseball that just isn't happening, Mr. Jay Parkin. Hey, Jay. Prime time. Prime time. <laughs> okay, Andy, I got. I heard about that song, but I had never. I never had to listen to it. I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> I never had to listen to it. He said. <laughs> We never had to listen to it before. So, so, Sharpie, I'm I have gonna, a song now. I, are we live, Sharp? Yeah, it says it's live in my corner. It says it's live in my corner. Yep. Yeah. And hi, we we're here. We're on the internet. We're on the internet. Yep. Yep. As far as I know. <laughs> wow. Wow. Our low budget show called Taylor Primetime is live again for the seventh episode. My name is Jay Park, and thank you again, Andy Lund, for your theme song. It was I, different than last week, too. Every week is a new theme song. Oh, so so I haven't got to hear the original theme song. No, you have I to go think... back to next week or last week's episode and check it out. All right. It's all for you, Rob. It's just uh, just to make you feel welcome and loved. Well, I appreciate that, Andy. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Taylor Primetime. Um, today's episode we have a very 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 special sidekick up there this chris sharp the gray hat on say hi chris hey everybody we got, we got mr andy lund down there he's our product specialist he helps us and plays some tunes every once in a while and the one and only rob mcgargle uh service network manager at taylor guitars welcome rob to taylor uh, geez thank you i appreciate that glad to be here uh, I love the fact that so when we're doing these zoom casts and all this kind of stuff going live on YouTube, I love the fact that everybody is sitting and, you know, last week, Andy had a big tapestry behind him and Sharpie's got a dog tail wagon. I, I just be clapping. My dog came running in from the other room. So. <laughs> this is a wonderful show where we kind of bring Taylor, some Taylor experts on and we just sit here and, you know, chat a little and answer some questions it's super exciting so rob mcgargle um we're super ha glad to have you here but we noticed your backdrop there you're you're sitting in front of a bunch of of books uh yes. do, you, do you read those books or are they there for looks i have read a book yes awesome was it uh how to how to make sure you have proper humidity on your guitar book I have definitely read that book, but it was probably had to do with fishing reels. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming on, watching, hanging out with us on Prime Time. Uh, today's subject is playability for life inside the perfect setup or inside the Taylor neck. So we're going to get into setup of the guitar. And boy, when we sent this email out uh, promoting this episode of taylor primetime i believe we got north of 200 questions back we love it thank you for sending in submitting your questions thank you for hanging out with us throw us questions all night long sharpie is going to manage that 
I'm going to run this conversation maybe into the ground, but it's fine. I'm really interested. I probably have a lot of questions for you too, Rob, but Rob, what in the heck do you do? Let's get into that. What do you do? What is a network or a service network manager do? Oh, well, I mean, in a, in a, in a 10,000 foot view, I run the warranty channel for Taylor guitars. That, that's really it. So I do all of the training. I work with the technicians. We figure out pace schedules. We, we help customers and dealers and technicians on making sure the guitars are taken care of in a timely manner. And we decide, you know, what is warranty, what isn't, and we work it out that way. That's, that's a 10,000 foot view. But I also do a lot within just making sure quality is is nice. I do a lot of travel um, training around uh, for our distributor network, uh, dealer network, and I also just want to make sure our guitars are are nice in the shop, so I I can get a look and see what they what they look like in Australia or say China, and then bring that back to the factory and go. Here's what I'm seeing good, and here's what I'm seeing where I think we should improve. So it, it's it's a it's a nice little mix of things that I get to do. How long have you worked at Taylor? I feel like you started the company. Well, I, well, I appreciate you saying that, but that's not even close to accurate. <laughs> no, but I started in 1991 in our Santee location. So I'm uh, 29 year anniversary was last March. So I'm in my 30th year right now. When you started, Rob, you, there was no service network manager then, right? That position did not exist. We were just a little tiny shop. I mean, I, I believe we had maybe 30 employees max. What was your I mean, that, it what was, was tiny. What was your first gig? What was your first job at Taylor? I, I was a builder. I was in the assembly department and uh, assembling building guitars. Hmm. It's hmm. it's just something that I've done and, and what what I think I should have been doing even when I was a child. It was like born in me i believe and, and then landing at taylor was just you know perfect yeah it's su it was super excited i was really excited when you it when you committed to doing this show um it was it's it's uh, it's always a good time i learned something from you every time and i hope the watchers and and viewers right now and people hanging out with us are they're going to learn something too um one more question before we dive into the setup of a guitar Okay. Is um, correct me if I'm wrong, but like Sharpie, you play the guitar backwards, correct? Yeah. You know what, Rob? I'm so glad you're here because Jay's been <laughs> I knew it was coming for I... seven episodes <laughs> of being left-handed. Um, so the playing field is is even tonight. So yes, it is. Um, hey, what one good thing is is <clears throat> any any lefty out there that's watching, uh, you can get any Taylor guitar that we make in left-handed. If they don't have it in your store, they can send it to you, and no one ever asks to borrow your equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. I'm just, I tease, I tease, but that's my, uh, what do they say in volleyball? Bump, set, spike, right? Mm -hmm. I got I to gotta set the ball or Sharpie to spike the ball and let everybody <laughs> know that we love left-handed players, but that we have a, a couple one sitting here for sure on this show who you rob you can play the guitar in all different directions though i mean well, righty, righty strung lefty lefty strung righty lefty upside down righty backwards like how did you learn to play all different directions on the guitar well honestly it was it it really was more a necessity than anything um i did start off true lefty that that is how i started playing when i was about five six years old um, but when I wanted to play an electric guitar, I, uh, my dad had a Telecaster, but it was right-handed. So I was like, well, he's got the electric guitar. He has the electric amp, but I want to play his guitar. So honestly, from a, a very young age, I flipped a right-handed guitar over and I didn't look at it as chords. And honestly, I still don't when I'm playing backwards. I think of it as the notes I'm supposed to press down. <laughs> and that's, that's maybe a different concept. For people but i'm not looking at it as well this is a d because the the chord formation is completely different when you're looking at it backwards but i knew that these three notes made a d or these three made a g and i just worked it that way and pretty soon it just became part of what i do ah what as a perfect a, what's that as a as a lefty at work that watches rob play sometimes it's inspiring because he's like wow you can take any guitar and, and play it great 
whether it's lefty or righty. And sometimes I just look at him like, I never want to touch a guitar again because <laughs> no one can play like that. <laughs> well, I, pr- I appreciate that, but always pick up a guitar and play. <laughs> That's true. Everyone watching, listening, hanging out with us, everyone pick up your guitar and play right after this show or during this show. Heck, turn us down, watch our faces and play guitar. We would not be, go. I mean, just do it. Pick I'm up not sure if Sharpie gave him a compliment or not, because he said, I just never want to, after I see Rob play, I just never want to play guitar. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to take it. I'm going to take the, I'm a half gla- glass, half full kind of guy. So I'm going to take, yeah. the, uh, I'm going to take the positive. Yeah. I got well, it. you know, I, I like it. I, I like to think of it this way. It's like, um, I got to see Andy Powers play in Japan this last year. And I knew Andy was a smoking player. I mean, I knew it, but I didn't, I, I never got to see him in a professional setting no. and play. And honestly, I, I just sat back and I couldn't believe it. So when you see something like that, I, I understand what Sharpie's saying, because it's like, you either want to go home and practice, or you just want to put all your stuff on reverb. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky I can really only count to four. and I only have to play four strings at a time. So it's fine. It's That's all okay. good. But there, this there is a perfect... Already come. They are flowing, you guys. We have a packed crowd already. This oh, good. Cool. That's good. I'm stoked on that. I can't see it at the moment. I'll, I'll look in a second, but I'm having a lot of fun hanging out right now. I have and, one, uh, can I ask one question first? No. And I'll, I'll be quiet for a while. No? Yeah, okay. sure. No. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Ask a question. Um, Rob, since he's, Rob's been at Taylor now for close to 30 years, he started as a builder. He's done several jobs. Um, and um, he's also had the um he's been lucky to go around the world and see how our guitars hold up in different climates and also to train people how to provide service in a tailor way for our our instruments but if i can ask rob one question if i could say what is the most common what's the most important thing all around the world that all acoustic and even electric guitar players need to pay attention to humidity that's it. That is number one. That is the key. If you like the way your guitar played when you bought it, take care of it, keep it clean, keep it humidified, and it will always play that way. If you neglect it, it's no different than anything else. It starts to fall apart. Mm. You just hijacked Sharpie's question for the day. Yes. Now I'm going to sit here for a half hour and try to figure out the next <laughs> one. We just came up with a new segment. And the new segment is yeah. that stump, stump the shark, stump the sharp, no steal the sharp. <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, okay. So all nonsense aside here, that was a really great question, Andy. Um, and you're talking about being able to play a guitar in all different directions. My segue there was set up. Yes. A setup means so many different things. It's understood in many different ways. I would go as as elementary as you can and take us through the gamut, run the gamut here, right? But what, why does a setup, a proper setup on the guitar matter? What, what What's the big deal? Well, the, the easiest answer is the, the guitar will play in tune better. I mean, that honestly, that's one of the easiest answers. It's gonna play a little easier and it's gonna stay in tune better, mainly from the strings not being stretched as much. Um, and that's, a, that's a, an extremely important part of guitar, especially for a beginner. If a beginning player, if the guitar isn't set up and playing properly, they can lose interest because it's, they're just struggling and they may feel that, well, it's them and they shouldn't be playing guitar when in essence, it really was the instrument that needed work. So I would say even like for a beginner, Jay, I think a higher quality instrument, not necessarily going and saying presentation series, but a higher quality instrument is a better way to start off learning because it can be more adjustable. It can be set up better and it will help that player. I lost your audio. That's because I this? muted. There you ah. go. There you it's go. because my dogs went I was crazy. Like, oh no, not again from last week. But... <laughs> I lost your audio. <laughs> that would have been awesome if that happened 
Uh, I don't know if you all were here last week, but our guest, Ed Granero, at one point decided to go like this. <laughs> for like three or four minutes, and we just rolled with it. So enjoy. This thing's happened on a low budget <laughs> live show. Um, okay, so great. Um, uh, the set, the setup. I've often heard you say, um, I had a, let me give you a predicament real quick. Okay. I had, a, I had an artist that we work with who beats the crap out of the guitar, plays mm -hmm. it really, really hard. He's a strummer. He does not play, uh, finger style at all. He doesn't know what that even means. And I came to you and I asked you, this guy's breaking, breaking strings every mm -hmm. single time he plays hard but the strings shouldn't break that that way um what about his setup I, if you recall this conversation did you tell me right out of the gate before we got to the other part that may cause the problem <laughs> but remember, do you remember what you said to me i asked what pick does he use right that, that's that is massive and it's one of those things that gets so overlooked and it's the easiest part of the guitar. Some picks are like a saw and they, they actually chop strings where others are, will glide over the string. So you can be more aggressive with them. So would you consider the pick that you use, the strings that you use part of the setup? Yes, they're all essential. Awesome. Um, now Taylor is, really known for a very quite quite low action we have we have a low factory spec action yes what are those specs do you know the the, the measurements and the numbers well judging that that's my job i would say yes i know <laughs> <laughs> bump okay set, spike bam okay so here's how it works i'm going to premise it with this a factory setup is not the setup it's a setup. It's not the perfect setup for a person. It's what we've came to the conclusion over years and years. That this is how our guitars should leave because they're brand new cookies, as we call them. Okay. So giving you these specs doesn't mean you have to run right out and get your guitar this way. It may be the perfect setup for you to do it, but it also may be the wrong setup. And I'll go into that afterwards. The lowest you want, and this is a guitar tuned to pitch with a straight neck with maybe three to four thousandths relief is no lower than 560 force on the bass string from the top of the fret to the bottom of the low E string. So that's where the measurement is. It's not from the fingerboard to the top of the string or the middle of the string. It's the top of the 12th fret to the bottom of the low E string, no lower than 560 force no higher than six. So you have like a 64th of an inch window to work on the base side to say what factory is. Now we'll switch to the treble. It's no lower than 364. So once again, same measurement style, top of the 12th fret to the bottom of the E string. And then the highest would be four. That's our little window in there of guitars. Anything within there, we would consider a factory spec setup. Uh my Stanley tape measure doesn't go to five sixty fourths. Maybe it does. I don't know. But what? What? So, so how? You know, what is the first step? What do people do when they get a guitar? We often say this on ta on tours, on factory tours. Um, this is a good time to talk about our neck design, mm -hmm. Taylor guitar and neck design. You were there, right, when they developed oh, yeah. the, the NT neck. Now, I, I watched it come straight through. And were you a part of developing that? Were you not? Um, not one single bit. <laughs> but you, <laughs> well, but they're yeah. like, you're going to work on this. And, and well, you are on, pro that at it, it, on, you know? on that end of it, yes, that's that's one of the things that I've always done at Taylor is we will design something and then they hand it to us and go. Does this work? Will it do this? Our tests say it does. What do you see? Now you put it through your test and do that. So yes, do in, in that sense, yeah, I, I was part of it. But designing it, no, not at all. Oh, so what did you do when you first saw it? 
when you first saw the NT neck with the shim design and it's like a, I mean, Bob's been bolting on necks forever, right? I mean, he uh, I've, I've hugged Bob. Did you? <laughs> Big Bob. Bob take that. You, you have to understand that back before the NT, now this is going way back in the history of Rob at Taylor Guitars, I was training everyone in assembly to sand out fingerboards, inlay and fret by hand. Okay, so every single guitar from 1991 to the year, basically 2000, I was the person training the uh, employees coming through final assembly. When the NT hit or the Taylor neck, the new technology at that time, now it's the Taylor neck, it was pre-sanded out, pre-inlaid and pre-fretted when it came into the department. I no longer had to do that job. And if anyone's ever tried to fret a guitar or send out a guitar, they realize how difficult that job could be. So try to train that in a production atmosphere and you'd understand. I was quite happy when the NT net came along. Uh, you, you weren't on the train of people calling, calling Bob crazy? No, I knew that train was there. I, I, I could see what was going on. I, I could see the reality of it. So you have to be living it. It's one thing to be on the outside of that wall and, and have speculation and, and that type of thing. It's another thing to be inside and living it and watching it live and breathe. So from the very first one, I was, man, they're onto something here. They're onto something. And by the time it was done, it was, it was fantastic. Just so you know, mm. we keep looking over here because we're monitoring our live feed. Uh -huh. so just, just so you know, you got a really great question. So impressed by the service I received on the humidity affected Taylor guitar. You covered over half the repair under warranty. Rob's team does a great job. Oh. Well, fantastic. Now, I want to give a little credit to other people as well, because yes, I am part of that team. And I would love to say it is only my team, but it's not. We do have two divisions of service. We have our customer service run by Glenn Wolf and his team. And then there's a service network that is run by me. Together, we really are one unit. So saying thank you, I think it's thank you to, to the whole entire crew. Rob, you're humble. We appreciate that. Go for it, Sharpie. I know you got a question. There's so many questions in here, and I love it. First of all, <laughs> can you guys hear me all right? I heard that. I can hear you just fine. Much. Okay, cool. Um, hey, hey, Sharp. What's up? We intentionally told you to turn down. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> first Sharpie, of all, welcome to the rest of your life. For, first of all, you got a hi, Rob, from Joel Hostler. Hey, hey Joel, what's through. up, buddy? So, so we one got of the, some, one uh, of the best employees Taylor Guitar has ever had, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Joel's awesome. Um, there was a question that came through from uh, Rob Seymour talking about setup. And so he asked, uh, do, let's see, do I need to do a different set of switching from light strings to medium strings? Oh, well, that's a really good question in there. And there's kind of a couple of answers there. If you had mediums on your guitar at first and there was a little too much relief, but you didn't realize it, and then you put lights on it, it may end up backing the neck off to the perfect relief and technically you did not do anything to the setup and it plays perfectly. However, if you had mediums on the guitar and let's say you had a very straight neck but it still played well for you and you put lights on it, it may then back bow slightly and then you may get a, a develop a buzz between like the first and third, fourth fret area where then maybe you need to tweak that truss rod and just loosen it a tad to get it back to that flat where it was with the mediums. So it's really simple adjustment, but that's how I would kind of kind of put those two together that you may not have to, depending on how your guitar was originally, or you may have to. So it's it's really one of those things. Oh man. They're, yeah, they, these keep coming through. Um, I mean the questions <laughs> over here are on fire. Is yeah, it, we, we have a lot of email questions that came through, but this thread is is uh blowing up, which is pretty awesome. We're we're stoked on all of these. I think well, that I, I think that um, it would be beneficial right now to ans answer as many of these questions as we possibly can. Okay. Are you are ready you for guys, some rapid fire? Are you guys watching? You ready for this? Because I think it's time. All right. Let's so, Sharpie. Let's see what we can do. You want to start on e the email questions 
Or I, I want to ask one that I actually wonder about with my guitar case. Okay. Um, okay. With the mini hygrometer, I think you had one, right? Somewhere around there. If you have one of those, where in your case is the best spot to put that to get a good read um, on your guitar, if that's what you are using? Um, if you have a cutaway, I would probably clip it where the cutaway is. If you don't have a cutaway, I would clip it in an area where the heel is. And, okay. and what's interesting about that, because that's actually a really good question, Sharpie. When we were working with Diodario, we, we've done quite a extensive research with Diodario and humidity because they have their little humidity track and we have ours as well. Yeah. Ours was inside the guitar at the tail end, correct? That's where ours goes. Theirs goes outside the guitar in the case. There was less than 1% difference in the readings, whether it was in the tail end of the guitar, inside the guitar, or at the cutaway area of the case. Gotcha. So as long as it's basically in the case, in that body area and not gonna you know, hit your guitar, mm -hmm. you're good. That's yeah. where it should be. Yep. Just keep it out of that headstock pocket up there. Uh, yeah, the headstock pocket, I mean, you, you can still read it there, but I would definitely keep it for the body. Okay. I, I'm going to throw one at you. And then, Jay, if you want to hit an um, email question, this one was pretty cool. Um, you had talked earlier about how picks and strings can affect your setup, yes. right? Now, obviously, whatever strings give you the, the sound you're looking for, whatever pick gives you the sound you're looking for is, is the right pick and string for you, right? Mm, but, that, well, that depends. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, that, that depends. Dumping Sharpie. You're stumping sharp. Um, I can give you that for strings to a point, and I can give you mm -hmm. that to picks for a point. If you like the feel of 11s, okay, so a very light gauge of string, and you really like to strum hard, that's not a good combination. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that may be the string you like, but, but the technique that you apply to those strings is not accurate. So it could be the same thing with a pick. And this is what happened with that artist. They were using a very thin pick and trying to get more volume and more volume out of the guitar. So what they end up doing is basically hitting the strings with their finger. The pick can't even recoil fast enough God. to get to the next string. Okay, so they break the D and G. And if you look at the radius of the strings on the guitar, that's gonna be the first one you hit with your finger. Okay, so it comes down to that. That's why he was breaking those strings. He was using the wrong guitar pick, switched to a medium pick that was not the cheese grater one, and he, it eliminated his issue. Rob's okay. talking. So, Rob's talking about something that's really common, I think, uh, uh, among beginning guitar players. And Jay's dancing because he's happy about something that Rob just said. <laughs> but but it's true, and I think that when you begin playing guitar, a, a, a thin pick is more forgiving. You don't have to be as accurate with your, your strumming hand with the thin pick. So it feel it feels like, oh yeah, this I feel better playing because it doesn't it's not flexy all over the place. But in essence, it it if if you as you get to be a little bit better, you start to you start to realize that a, a thicker pick actually sounds completely different. It's darker. And you'll get more tone out of your guitar, yeah, there's no doubt. You actually have more control. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jay. That, that, that is factual. Jay, you're coming up, but real quick, I'm hijacking one more for you. Um, <laughs> how are the Andy Powers design guitars maintained differently from Bob design guitars? Maintained differently? They're not maintained differently at all. Okay. Not at it's all, a solid they... wood guitar. Wood is wood, whether it's your Martin, your Taylor, your Bob Taylor design, your Andy Powers design, they're just guitars. Mm -hmm. going, going from v uh, X-Brace to V-Class models, is there any setup changes in the way that we would set up that guitar no no those guitars leave at the same factory spec that we've always done um it's it's what taylor is yes andy yeah. powers is designing them but we have a spec yeah. and this is what we leave them and we let them go out as now i want to touch on that a little bit too because i don't think we went into it quite deep enough on when i was mentioning the the action specs the reason we send them out so low we know the guitar uh isn't done yet it's like taking a batch of cookies out of the oven. You need to put them on a, a sheet and let them cool down before you can eat them. A guitar needs to pull in slightly. It's going to do its thing. It's brand new. The top's never had tension. 
the next never had tension. So if we set it up with say a, a, a action where someone goes, man, I could really power this thing. In four months, it's gonna play terribly because it's really gonna pull hard because the action was too high, leaving the factory as a brand new guitar. So having that lower action, it may not be perfect for every player, but it is perfect for a tailor. That's that's great, Rob. You know what? I, I think that we should just take a pause real quick before we answer any more questions and kind of define a couple of things. There's okay. not a lot of people, you know, there could be some beginners out here who don't really understand what the word action even, even means, sure. right? So if you could give us just a elementary de definition of action, then an elementary definition of, uh, of scale length on a guitar. Because a lot of people don't know that either. So go. Well, the scale length is just measuring from the saddle to the very front edge of the nut. So like a full scale guitar, when someone says full scale, it's 25 and a half inches on a standard guitar. Now there's variations within that. Okay, so you may think that, wow, my Les Paul plays nicer than my Strat. Well, that's because it has a slightly shorter scale length. Okay, so it feels a little more comfortable because the frets are just ever so slightly closer together. Now the map is still divided up correctly to where a D is a D and a G is a G, but that scale length has been shortened slightly. And you'll see that on Taylor's. You'll see guitars that we do have short scale and we do have standard scale or long scale. So that's just a measurement and it'll come down to you on what you really feel is comfortable. Now action wise is really the height of the string off the fingerboard. I mean, in a nutshell, as easy as you can say it, that is the action of the guitar. It is the bottom of the string and where it is sitting in relationship to the top of the fret and the fingerboard. That's awesome. Thank you. I hope, that. That, I hope I didn't get too deep on that one. So. No, I think that was I think that was perfectly fine. But sometimes we need to remind people and 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 like when I ever give a factory tour, I always say I'm sorry for all of you guitar players who know all of this, but some people, some per, somebody out there might not. So we're just going to refresh you on that one. Jay, so. I'm telling you, when I when I train a top level technician, I still start from the very beginning of Taylor and what we do. Because they may not know one thing, they may know several, but there may be a part they don't know, and I don't want to skip it. Yeah. I may go through it quickly, but I agree with that. You have to start, and you have to you got to give all the information. That's awesome. So this this next this question, and Mark R sent this question via email. Okay. What is the best order of operations to follow when doing a setup? I love that question because they're. <laughs> absolutely is an order of operation. Um, the first thing you want to do is tune the guitar to whatever tuning it needs to be in. So if that guitar is a dadgad tuning, tune it there. If it's A440, half a step down, whatever that is, tune it to that. Now check your truss rod. Now check if the neck is straight or not. Now that's by pressing down at the first fret or you could capo the first fret also. And then Press down at the body joint on the low E or the high E. And then tap the string in the middle really lightly and see what the gap is from the bottom of that string to the top of the seventh or eighth fret. What you want is basically the thickness of a piece of paper to slide underneath it. That would be considered straight because what you don't want is it backbowed. You don't want it high centered to where there's no tap of that string. So you would tune it to pitch. You would get the neck straight. Now you can evaluate your action. Okay, now you can look and go, well, man, even though I did this, my action is still really high off the fingerboard. So now what do you do? You're going to check humidity. You want to make sure you're looking at that. Now you can look at your neck angle. You can, you can side down the neck or use a straight edge and run it on the outside of the fingerboard. This is going kind of deep, but I'm, I'm going to go there. You can run it on the outside of the fingerboard and see where it lines up with the bridge. Because what you don't want to do is just lower a saddle when what you need to do is to take the neck off and tilt it back and give it a reset. Now that could be a Fender Strat, it could be a Taylor, it could even be a Martin. And there's guys out there like Joe Hostler who can just remove that Martin neck, tilt it back, and then go and finish up the setup. So the last thing you'll do is lower the saddle. So it's tuned to pitch, make sure the neck is straight, check your humidity, 
look at your neck angle, and you roll from that point. I've seen Rob teach this to a lot of people around the world, and they the basic thing about tuning a guitar to pitch is a mystery to many. <laughs> it makes so much sense, right? Because the guitar, like we when we had Andy on, we had Bob on talking about the guitar is designed to be held at tension. Yes. So how can you get any measurements that are any, anywhere near accurate without it being at tension? So real basic stuff. How many people do you think you've trained, Rob, over your years? Oh, man. Andy, it's probably a thousand, maybe more. Okay. I, I mean, with everyone that's came through Taylor Guitars and, and everyone I've I've worked with personally in, in my own shop at Taylor to around the world. Oh yeah, geez, a lot of people, cool. a lot. And and I know you've heard me, you know, use that how to assess a guitar, and you you know I you've heard this from me. I call it the Big Three. That's that's what I call it. Right. And, uh, and, and it matters. I do that on every guitar and I do it myself when I'm looking at someone's guitar. I, I, I don't do something different than what I'm explaining to others to do. Is it safe to say that you've seen everything? No. <laughs> really? No, we, you've never seen everything. I mean, sometimes we sit back and scratch our head and go, how did they do that? Yeah. <laughs> I had a guitar sidebar. I had a guitar uh, that an artist sent back and the headstock was snapped off. Okay. And Rob knew exact impact on the case in which and when the headstock snapped off. He was like, <laughs> no, nope, this is what happened. <laughs> well, from that, now that's just guitar experience. forensics. Yeah. Dude, guitar well, forensics. Okay. There is something to be said there now, and I'm going to go back into setup on that as well. There's a lot of guitars that I have to set up for people that I don't know how they play. I don't know if they're a beginner. I don't know if they're advanced. So the guitar has to tell me. So Sharpie, there really is guitar forensics. I look at the frets. I look at the string gauges. I look at the marks where they strum. I look at the pick guard. What's happening with this guitar to allow me to set it up the best it can. Um, Tim Godwin was, was kind of blown away, our artist relations uh, gentleman, when he goes, you need to set these guitars up for this person. I'm like, okay, let me get on YouTube. He's yeah. like, why? I'm like, I want to see how they play. Yeah. And I flip it onto a concert. Sure as heck, man, they use a capo almost the whole time. So that's a total different setup for that guitar than me just setting up a factory guitar. So there are things that I will do personally, one guitar forensic, two search the artist, search the person, um, to do a proper setup for that individual. That's that actually brings up a question uh, for for musicians who play with a capo sometimes, mm -hmm. not always. And, uh -huh. and, and how do you set that up? Do you find a, a, a nice midpoint between how you would set up a, a guitar with a capo versus not? or Or how would you do that? I call it a tweener setup. So yeah, tweener. Of course. <laughs> I call it a tweener. So what they're going to get, what they'll get is probably a guitar with a slight bit more relief than you would probably want it. But what then I'll do then is I'll also cut the nut slots down a little bit lower. So when they are playing between the first and third fret, it feels like a normal setup. But then when they add that capo at the fourth fret, there's enough string rotation still for the guitar because of the relief and the neck angle, how I've set it, that it doesn't, you know, um, just choke out, you know, the strings. It actually sounds like it's supposed to. So you do have to find that middle ground of the setup. And we do call it a tweener or a capo setup for the guitar. Cool. That was an awesome question. You want another one or you want me to ha ask one, Sharpie? Bring it on. Ooh. I mean, I'll, I'll throw one at you that came from Patrick Evans via email. Okay. Um, Patrick had asked, on average, how often should you set up your guitar? And I do wonder Ooh. on that, is that something that you would consider to be like an annual thing for somebody? If someone's new into working on their own guitars, or is it as you progress? What would you say to somebody that is just what why am i what am i learning from rob in this sense and and how do i apply that to my guitar now as i'm getting ready to work on it myself okay if your guitar has been taken care of and it's playing well 
you don't have to set it up anymore. You have to clean it. Mm -hmm. You have to maybe do a trash rod adjustment here or there, but that's pretty much all you're gonna have to do to that instrument. Now, if you have guitars where you're not taking care of them humidity wise, and it's sitting out and just hanging on the wall, you may have to do some adjustments throughout the year. Now that's not happy for the guitar, but it is something you'll have to do if you are not paying attention to the care of that instrument. Um, as an example, my own Taylor from 1991, I don't touch it, I just play it. I leave it in the case. Um, I've got my humidor packs, my hygrometers in there, and my guitar plays beautifully. Um, I don't remember the last time I actually adjusted the neck on that guitar. So as long as it's in great shape originally and you take care of it, you should be fine. Now, that doesn't mean you can't tinker with your guitar. That doesn't mean you can't experiment and have fun with it. Just remember how to get it back to where it was if you go a little too crazy with it. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a quick little story. Back when I was a kid, Sharpie, I mean, way back with guitar, I think I was... Um, Eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade, I got my first electric guitar. Oh, 1994, right? Yeah, 1994. <laughs> now, I think that was uh, 1978. I'm looking at my guitar going, man, I really kind of want to adjust this a little bit. How do I do it? I don't know, but there's all these Allen heads on everything. It was a Fender guitar. There's all of these things I can turn. So what I did is just wrote everything down. I put the Allen wrench in there and I said, well, I turn this one twice. Okay. The E string on the left side of the saddle, I did it twice. The other one, I did it twice. And I marked that and I wrecked my guitar and it played terrible, but I was able to backtrack and get it back to where it was. Yeah. So you're not hurting anything by experimenting and having fun and, and doing that. But um, knowledge helps when, you, when you're doing that. And in, in where, sorry, I'm, I'm actually asking all of my own questions now, but <laughs> if somebody's here listening to to this and, and where, where do you go get that knowledge? Is there a website? Is there calling a service line? Like wh what would you recommend for someone going, hey, I want to I want to learn how to work on my guitar. Where, where do they find that knowledge? You can go online and just look up guitar service books, guitar repair books. You can go on YouTube and look at videos of people, but it's the same thing when you start doing that. You can get a lot of bad information. So you have to take it with a grain of salt and weed through things and look and, and, and critically think about it and go, is this what I should be doing to my guitar? Should I really go there with this? And do I have the, the, the ability to do this? So I would start by reading, learning, watching, um, and then do little tiny increments little tiny things to the guitar, you know, maybe change a set of tuners, adjust your neck, you know, simple things. I wouldn't jump into fret leveling, fret dressing, replacing a bridge. Um, I would start small and just, and get, get some tools and enjoy yourself. Yeah. I, uh, I got tar teched professionally for a long time with bands touring around the world. And, and I wish I would have had somebody like you to give me some pointers back then. Cause sometimes you just got to it's trial and error. You gotta, you gotta right. figure it out. Um, it's good. You get question. the right information. That learning curve is, it isn't so steep. It's like it plateaus. Yeah. Some, so I had a couple of mentors who, who really, you know, would steer me in the right direction, but this one's really interesting. Uh, yeah. a question John wrote in, uh, via email. Uh, I was once told that the action on a tailor was adjusted by using shims to alter the neck angle. Locally, if I asked the luthiers, uh, just say it's a matter of shaving the bridge, which is the best course of action. Okay, well, that technician has never worked on a Taylor guitar. So what they are refer what they're referring to and reverting back to is old methods of a dovetail glued neck. So if they don't want to remove the neck, if the customer is like, I'm not removing the neck on the guitar, I'm not gonna pay you the cost. You really only have two options. If the neck is straight and it's tuned to pitch, like we say, and the action is still tall, you're gonna lower the saddle down to a point where there's still brake angle. And if that isn't acceptable, well, now you are sanding down the bridge. I don't think that's the way to go ever. I honestly say, if you have a molded neck like that glued in dovetail style, 
do the reset. Save up your money and get the reset done and have it done right. You're, you're, you're taking the guitar down a path it shouldn't go down. But a Taylor guitar, yes, we do have our shim system within the Taylor neck. And we do get the neck angle back first. And then we adjust microly your truss rod, your nut heights, and the saddle. So we can do quite a bit on the setup. So yes, there are shims on the Taylor guitars from the year 2000 forward. That's, uh, yeah, it's spectacular. Thank you. I hope that. I'm not going too deep on some of this. So I hope you are going too deep. This is like the nerdiest low budget <laughs> guitar show on the planet. I'm and, trying to keep uh, it as, I'm trying to keep it as go a little far, but not too crazy, you know, just to. Steven. It's so nerdy that we don't have any props. That's how that's how low budget it is. We have zero props. <laughs> we no, just got music thinking, last week. I was thinking yeah. today, I you know, I, I have what Rob's talking about is these little spacers that could be in the guitar repair world misunderstood as a shim that goes underneath the saddle. That's not exactly. what he's talking about. He's talking yeah. about two spacers that allow the neck angle to change in relation to the body yep. in increments of two thousandths of an inch. Yep. And that, that's the short beauty of the taylor nt neck it's no longer called the nt neck andy i say it, it, is, I say it, it i'm ways. sorry it is to me. Ways, I, 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 there that's what i call it i know it's the taylor neck it's, it's ingrained in here it's it's the nt <laughs> it's no longer new technology my friends anyway tell that, to, tell that to the technician that didn't know how to adjust it if that it's not new technology Spider, you, you know what? Spider Logan over here online, yeah, on the on, who's in the feed said, you know what? Just go to an authorized Taylor dealer. <laughs> Good call. Let's Good get call. Spider on the show. Yeah. <laughs> Good call. However, let's get back to questions. Sharpie, you got any questions for Rob? I do. Uh, Steve had asked, can you give any tips on setup ideas for a person who is dealing with arth arthritis in their hands? Um, which yeah. is causing difficulty playing. How would you set up a guitar for somebody dealing with that? Well, I'd like to see how they play, but I, I would absolutely go with a minimum of a factory Taylor guitar setup. I really would. I would go with a, an action at that five and three is what we were talking on the bass, the treble. I would have a nice straight neck. I would make sure the nut is cut to the lowest point to where the strings don't rattle when you first hit the, you know, the open string. It needs enough rotation to not sit across that first fret and, and, and resonate. Um, and I would make sure that the angle's correct. I, I would make everything as soft for the player as possible. Then it'll come down to string gauges. Do they want lighter trebles and heavier bass or even you know vice versa? But that's what I would do. I would go with a very low action setup with a nice straight neck to where it's very comfortable for the player. Wow. Hope that helps. I think Rob dropped the mic. Yeah, he did. You got any more questions, Sharpie? You want me to ask some? Uh, you can ask one. I'll, I'll let you I, take one. Ma I enjoy let's, it. Uh, let's get one from the uh, from the live feed over here. We're coming through right now. Oh man, let's. We got a ton. Amen. Do the reset. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. That's where it's at. Shaving the bridge. Are you insane? <laughs> Well, I, they, it isn't insane, but I understand where they're coming from. Yeah. But some people don't have the money for the reset and they do want the guitar to play. So and it is a way to do it. So, you know, there's that you're balancing at that point. So it's an established repair that's been done for a long it, time. It is an established repair. Yes. And it, and it can work. It's just that we have the ability with the taylor neck jay oh to to adjust in yeah to adjust um in small tiny increments without having to do that so that's right. what we, that's what we choose to do we want the break right. uh z has a uh, a statement so i'm just going to give you this i want to see rob change strings on a 12 string in under five minutes Ooh. oh i can totally do that <laughs> i can totally do that that's nothing <laughs> Yeah, but they mild have to confidence in, in that. Yeah, they have to be in tune. I can do that too. Okay. I'll tell you something that was funny. I was in Korea. We were doing a restring event. Okay, we were in Seoul, and the distributor's like, "Oh, I hate when nylon string guitars come in because they take me so long if I'm doing." I'm like, "I can do nylon in like five minutes. It's nothing. It's not a big deal." 
He's like, you can. So well, of course, what happens? A nylon customer comes in. <laughs> Get the guitar all cleaned up. He walks up to me with a stopwatch and goes, okay, do it. I wasn't <laughs> even sweating. I was just going through the motions of doing it. And I think it was like five minutes and three seconds. <laughs> so it can be done. It's like anything else. You're just used to it. It's what you've done your whole entire life. So something that may seem difficult for others can be just a normal day for someone else. Uh, I think what Z might be referring to is there's a video out online here, maybe on YouTube. There's one on Facebook. I know for sure. You're I'm going there, aren't you, Jay? I am because I love it so much. It's so good. It's trending. Polarizing, yeah. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of views on it, and it's uh, Rob changing strings. Uh, it's like the fastest string string change. Pretty good. I think you did good. I don't I, know if, if it's the fastest, but it's fast because <laughs> I didn't cheat. <laughs> if I could cheat, I know I could. I could take some uh, some seconds off of that. So. Yeah, like locking tuners, right? I had a guy race me once, and he had locking tuners on everything. And I was like, no, no, We're doing this. We, we, we like certain amount of wines. We like a certain amount of things. I think the guitar I used had Godos, which had like you know twenty-one to one gear ratio. So you're spinning those things, and it takes forever. So <laughs> if you had like a sixteen to one gear ratio, and I wasn't worried about what I was doing, I could probably knock thirty seconds off. Oh man, that would be awesome. Maybe next time we'll have Rob do a. No, I'm not doing that. That was 10 years ago, Rob, I believe. I think it was 2009, wasn't it? You retired your speed string changes? Sort of. It's pretty that's fast. It's pretty fast for a fisherman. Let's just say that. Let's leave it at oh, that. Oh, that's <laughs> awful. Oh. See, that's they're rough, man. We've got a tough crowd going on right here. <laughs> basing on the lefties, basing on the fisherman. Whoa. Uh, man. Man, that's not just me. <laughs> uh, there's, hey, there, there's, there's, a, there's a good one that came through. Um, it, it doesn't have to do with guitars or setup, but uh, there is someone named Pius that is in here. And he asked, uh, does, do you humi humidify the cases before you ship the guitars out? Yes. There you go, Paul. We have a room that every case comes up. It's opened up. It sits in the room making sure it's acclimated and then the guitars go in. Okay, and then from there, we actually put them in a bag and we zip tie them up tight and fold it over. So when you receive that guitar, it's a factory, excuse me, a factory guitar. Because there's lots of wood in the case of your guitar and a lot of people don't consider that when they're humidifying their guitars, correct? Yeah, we can go a little nerdy now. There's 417 grams of water turned into vapor in a guitar case that's wood that's at 50% relative humidity. That's a lot of water, believe it or not. That's a pretty large water bottle. It's like it's like half of a, a, a water yeah. bottle, right? Or three uh -huh. of a water bottle. Yeah, absolutely. Man, the things you learn with Rob McGargle. Knowledge bombs left and right. We can go really nerdy. I mean, we can we can go into the minutiae if that's what we want to do. Right. But <laughs> well, we've been we've been live for a very long time. Uh, I think we should ask a couple more questions, then get into our favorite segment called Sharpie's question. Okay. Uh, there is questions. I mean, they are nonstop. Hey, there's one guy in here. I mean, where'd you go, Matt? I got an AD twenty seven on pre order. Make sure mine is a good one. I can tell you. Uh, Matt, I can tell you straight up, it's going to be a good one. Those guitars are great, so you don't have to worry about it. That guitar, I got, I got to play one the other day. I was blown away. Yeah, they are. Fantastic. I was blown away. Was it a uh, lefty? Really? <laughs> are we really going there? And you're a lefty? <laughs> oh, this is great. No, <clears throat> I love doing this. This is so good. Um, guitar cases in the world. Still okay. Uh, humidify the case. Hmm. Yep. We got a couple more questions. There are so many questions. We got to get AD twenty seven. Oh, here's a here's a here's a. I can answer this question. Aaron asked, "Why do we change D Diodario strings on the uh, American Dream series? Because they were available." <laughs> I, I'm I'm assuming. I don't know. 
Do you know why we changed to an, a, a Diodario? I believe, um, I believe that would be it. We were in the middle of a pandemic, and we were able to get Diodario strings. Interesting. That would probably be what I would, I believe, the answer. That's as that's as good answer as I could have ever came up with because I have no idea. So yeah. I'm uh, going. Great. The Diodarios are great strings. Our, our nylons are Diodario, correct? Our nylons are Diodario. Yes. Yeah, so are GS Mini bass strings. Yep. And so typically we have elixirs that we typically put on our guitars. Mm -hmm. Awesome strings, Diodarios. Things. A, a lot of people, and, and I reiterate that sometimes when I do tours or we're doing shows out wherever we might be, and it's it's the strings are going to change the sound of your guitar. Find find yep. the string brand that is best for your sound. You know, right. so they, it's not the end all be all and whatever comes on your guitar, whether it's a Taylor or any other brand. You get to do a lot of experimenting and exploring with both your pick and string making a unique sound to you, correct? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Man, People I want you back for another episode. Someone said, you yeah, bring Rob back. So you I have think to come we should bring Rob us. back for certain. Um, here's a good question. Hey, it came through from our favorite Paul Tobias. Hi, Paul. Paul. You know what? Paul watches every single show. He's probably sipping on a scotch and it's awesome. Thank you for joining us again, Paul. Uh, how do you feel about lowering slash sanding the saddle? That's a really good question. That depends. There isn't a don't do it or do it. I think of the saddle when I'm working with a Taylor guitar as a micro adjustment. So if I'm gonna set up a Taylor guitar, what I'm looking at is my treble action because I know that that is the, the lowest height that we have on our factory saddle. So I'm gonna to try to nail that action first. And if I, have to drop the bass side for a customer, I will. Because that's where we have that window of there, that three or four on the treble to five or six on the bass, because every guitar is a little different. They pull a little different, they move a little different. So every guitar can't be five and three or six and four. So there's a little bit of micro adjustment available for technicians or dealers. At the factory, we do not touch the saddle in production. We work off of our neck angle, we put the saddle in, and 99.9% .9 of the time, our action is within our factory spec without having to do anything. We, we designed it into it that way. But for the technician, absolutely, that saddle can be micro adjusted when it's needed. My goodness. You're a wealth of knowledge, my friend. It looks like Sharp's got a question up there. Okay. Oh, no. I, I was just noticing Joel Hostler's in here and 7C popped up. So I think his father's in here as well. So. Hi, Dave. Hi, Joel. All, all the uh, all the all my guys, are, all are my here. guys. Hey, people don't know this. I trained David Hostler at Taylor Guitars, <laughs> and he actually did a really great job. The guy's got skills. So seven C's, Joel and Dave. You guys got good people down there. That's awesome. Um, all right. So we time flies when you're having fun. We yes. went live a little late tonight because YouTube loves us. Uh, so. Well, well, I think it's that time of the night, Andy. Uh, we're going to get into Sharpie's question. So uh, could you play me a little uh, jingle? He had a question in mind, but I stole it because it was also mine. But now he's had some time to think of another Sharpie's question. Sorry about that, buddy. Sorry, sorry. I Are we supposed it. to be having this much fun? <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're working. <laughs> we're working. <laughs> Love it. So, so Rob, I, I oh, have well, hold on, a... hold on. I want to jump in. As I want people to understand, this is Taylor Guitars, guys. Yeah. We work, but we have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. It's why we all stick around. Everyone's been yeah. here. I think Jay's the newest guy here, right? Yeah, man. Um, let's see. So I did have a minute to. Uh, to think about that and let's set up for a second um going between our layered wood guitars that we make in Takati versus mm -hmm. our solid wood that we make in El Cajon okay. when you're setting up those guitars is there anything you need to consider on the different 
uh, wood types layered versus solid, whether it's the backs that, that don't have bracing versus that have bracing, is, is any of that taken into consideration or is it purely how that neck is set up, string height, all of that? It's purely the neck angle, the bridge, saddle, nut, uh, neck adjustment itself. The, the, it could be made out of cardboard yeah. and you still have to go through the proper diagnostics and the, the order of operation to make the guitar set up. So our Takati layered woods versus El Cajon solid wood, it's identical in the setups as well. You take a 214 Deluxe, you take a 314, it's the same setup. Which I've been preaching for a dozen years now that the same quality that goes into a custom, a 900, a builder's edition goes into any other guitar that you can get from Taylor. Yeah, I, I'm you always- get the same love. Yeah, I always thought of it this way, especially when I was training people, it could, because they needed to know what they were building. They needed to know that this was somebody's guitar or it's going to be somebody's guitar. So they saved up a lot of money for this. So a, a 214 is not an inexpensive guitar. Now the person who can afford a presentation series may say a 214 is an inexpensive guitar, but it's not. The person who saves up that money for the 214 deserves the same as the person who has a presentation. They deserve the same. It isn't lesser. 100%. I got my GS Mini and my 110. There you love go. Them, love them both. Man, oh man. Hey, that was a good question, Sharpie. On the fly. Thought about it in, uh, what, 20 minutes? We have, Deb, you do me a favor, Sharp, over there, and you look you for bet. a stump the guest question. Um, another question Gabe has to have one for us. Gabe, another question one. came in, and um, it's kind of a, a, a couple part question here. But Lyndon writes, uh, I adjusted my Academy 12E mm -hmm. with a truck rod, as Rob mm -hmm. explained. Mm -hmm. But the action is still too high. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing the bolt on the neck of the A12 needs to be reset. The neck needs to be reset. So the neck needs to be taken off the guitar and reset. So he did everything right. He tuned it, straightened the neck, and realized the action is still too high. Now it's time. He self-diagnosed. It was great. He self-diagnosed. Now it's time to kick that neck back, and the guitar is going to play beautiful. Take it to an authorized service center. Give us a call. Call Glenn. Call my team. You'll be good to go. You know what? Rob, you're, you know what, Sharp? Rob has too much good information. I don't think we need to stump him. I, <laughs> no. I don't know. I, I think the only question we can ask him is, is thank you for skipping fishing tonight to hang out with us. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Thank right. you for not fishing. I, I did. I honestly did skip fishing, and right now it is a crazy good bite. So no. you're lucky that I love Taylor Guitars because I'm here doing my thing. <laughs> uh this one's this one's good so instead of playing a episode or a segment called stump the guest we are going to look at gabe's question gabe did gabe o'brien came in with one ready and it's it's a topic rob okay. can you tell us about one of the worst guitars you've ever seen come into service <laughs> uh, yeah. on your way oh, that's absolutely. what we want to know uh, i had one that was so filthy I mean, so filthy. This guitar was easily 15 years old and had never been cleaned. Never. It was so bad. I looked at it. I'm like, and the sales rep that brought it to me, I won't mention his name because I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, I just looked at him like, All right, what is this? I mean, you brought me this? I mean, I physically went to the finish room I got in a finish suit. Oh, no. <laughs> I put on gloves and a respirator, soaked it down with deglosser de or degreaser, got my scraper blades out, and scraped all of the whatever was on the guitar off of it. Bunk. I got photos of it. It's, 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 I can't show them here, obviously. I couldn't believe how bad it was, but when it was done, it was a really nice old looking guitar that was clean and played beautifully.
but that was probably the worst one where I really just had to suit up completely like hazmat because it, I just couldn't get that close to it. The owner probably didn't like the way it sounded after you cleaned it up either. <laughs> no, they actually, they, they were quite happy. And I did explain that they should hit it with a rag once in a while, you know, the guitar polish is a thing and polish cloths are a thing. And, you know, so. <laughs> so, so that guitar might have sounded a little muddy when you got it. <laughs> a little dark. That's a good way to put it. A little dark. Sounded a little funky. <laughs> All right. Sounds a little funky. All right. We got a couple more rapid fire questions just because they're coming in and they're really good. But then, okay. ladies and gentlemen, we're going we're gonna to sign off for tonight or else we will be. This is the problem when you have Rob on the show is you never want him to see. We're going to have to bring you back, Rob. You'll be a- That's fine, man. We can, we can do this all day. We're good. We awesome. When fishing season is over, we're, we're getting you back. So our I live in San Diego. <laughs> There's no such thing as a fishing season. <laughs> we just go fishing. <laughs> Sun is uh, always one here. Rapid fire these answers if you want. Uh, okay. Are you are you as concerned about humidity on a layered wood guitar versus solid wood guitar? I have a GS Mini 310 CE and a 614 Builders Edition. Yes, I am. Still a solid neck, solid top, solid bridge, solid braces. Everything is solid, but the sides and back are layered. So yes, still just as concerned. Bam. Does humidity affect the neck joint? The what? Does humidity affect the neck joint? Yes, it does. If it shrinks, you'll see little lines of the little filler putty we do, and it looks like it's cracked. The bolts will loosen, and you can get what we call a body whiplash, because even though the strings are pulling the neck up, it can move side to side. If it's overhumidified, it really pushes against the neck, and it can push the body pocket section up. And if you try to take the neck off to do a reset, you could damage the guitar. So yes, overhumidified and underhumidified can have an adverse effect to the guitar. Nice Neve shirt, Andy. That was a comment. <laughs> you should just put a question mark at the end of it. Nice <laughs> Neve shirt, Andy. Got it. Uh, and oh, you're right, Philip. You could have. We could have a whole episode on strings. That would be great. Let's oh, we told. Oh man, strings are. That's a massive thing. I love it. Oh, I can't Ooh, wait here. to tell them. Yeah. Okay. You got, got one, one more. more. I got one last more. One more, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, okay. Richard, Richard's got the last question of the night. Is a Taylor soft case acceptable to store a guitar in uh, for humidity compared to a hard case? Almost every single guitar I own is in a gig bag. I have oh. one guitar in a hard shell case, so yes. Is it easier to fix a wet or dry guitar? A wet or a dry guitar, excuse me, I can rehumidify it a whole lot better than trying to wring that thing out. So you would say... It's not wise to um, take your guitar into the shower with you every morning so that you maintain enough humidity. Well, it's wise if you want it to fall apart. <laughs> All right. Don't do that. Don't do these things at home. Don't do that. Get we, on our website. We follow our instructions. Guitar. We have follow pictures of a guitar that was, was in the shower. We, we have photos for all the training. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. A, a 814 Deluxe, two weeks old, fall apart. So you've seen a really dirty guitar and a very clean guitar. That's cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Extremely clean. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more, one more thing here, Rob. So would you say the setup of a guitar matters? It's everything. Yeah. And, and now let, let's, let me premise it with this. The setup has to be for you. There isn't like a setup. There, there, there's a guide of where it should kind of fall, but it really does matter how you play, what you do, what your style is. It, it, it comes down to you. It's a very personal thing. And would you say um, to set guitars up differently depending on the different styles that you play? Like if you're a heavy strummer, would you set it up one way if you... Played, played another guitar with the finger style, would you set it up a different way? Yes, exactly. I would. I would. All right. So what I think that the moral of the story here is we all have to have a ton of guitars. Don't we? Already? Who has <laughs> one guitar? <laughs> that's like saying you only have one fishing rod. That, that's not true. That's right. Oh, back to fishing. 
It's always oh, fishing. Hey, come with on this there. You know who you're looking at. You know who you're talking to. I know. I, I, I've got I've got a different baseball hat for every day, so it's fine. I don't think the the, the well maybe they do now, but I don't think the listeners understand it. If I'm not doing guitars, I'm fishing, and both of them are on the highway on the same lane. That's just how I. That's just how I am. All right. What? No. All right, here we go. No more fishing. We're going to keep you going. All right. So, some you know music. What? We've been here. We went long today because we were with you, Rob, and it's always fun. Hey, if we didn't get to answer your questions this time, we will answer your questions next time. We'll do the best we can to answer your questions in the feed, uh, so on. And you know what? Since you played us in, Andy, why don't you play us out? Yes. <laughs> What was it? What was it? It was prime time. It was prime time. What the heck was it? What was it? It was prime time. Prime time. Rob came on the show and told us what he knows about neck angles and humidity control. He loves to catch a bass. But he can be such a pain in a discussion about football. <laughs> Especially the Chargers. He's taught with 1,000 texts. And he's rocked them all. Bye, guys. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>